What's going on, snacky people? <laughs> we are in for now a meth snack right here. And the first, take your seats, grab your cup of tea, Yorkshire tea, <laughs> and listen to this little story of Papa, okay? This is going to be quite a special math snack right here. Geometry, anal thing. Okay, so back then, if you take a look at my old FabMit channel here, yeah, it was seriously called FabMit, you can find a lot of origami stuff, okay, and enkirigami stuff. I was doing this origami stuff with a lot of passion, it was so much fun. And every time I have a piece of paper in my hand, I just start folding all the time, okay. And recently I sat in the bus, I was sitting in the bus, and there I was having a square sheet of paper in my pocket at the back of my mobile phone, still there, it was like my little list for shopping, okay. And I was just starting to fold because it's fun folding stuff. And back then I knew a lot of algorithms to actually divide pieces of paper into, well, for example, fifths and thirds and whatsoever, all those prime number folds, okay. And and folding stuff into two pieces is pretty easy. You can fold diagonals. And I was just thinking, how the fuck was I able to actually fold a piece of paper into thirds? I mean, there's the intuitive method. You are going to grab both sides and then you are going to adjust it kind of, okay? Um, but there are algorithms out there to actually divide a piece of paper into three parts or prime number parts just by using characteristic lines. For example, folding it in two and then using diagonals, which are really easy to fold. And thus, you can easily construct yourself thirds, fifths, sevenths, whatsoever. So those prime numbers are really hard to handle. But once you have them, you can construct all other types of folds out of them. For example, a 14th fold or something or a nine fold, okay? <laughs> I came up with one method I've never seen before. It was quite ingenious. And I started calculating and it didn't work out any good. So my, my first calculation went berserk and it was just stupid. Then I calculated it a second time and wham! It was just pretty fucking fabulous, okay? We're going to talk about this method at first and then about the regular method I um, had in my head somewhere here in the back and I came up with it once again out of muscle memory. So here's a clip of the first way to actually fold a piece of paper and then we are going to go through the actual mathematics on this. This is how we are going to start it off. We are going to do a trivial two-fold, meaning we are going to divide this piece of paper into two equal parts. That's a trivial fold, one of the characteristic folds that you can simply do. Now, notice we have this fold right here. And now we have the choice to do four more trivial folds. This one, this one, this one, and this one. It really doesn't quite matter which one you choose at this point. So let us, for example, connect this point and this one right here. Okay, easiest to fold it over and then just connect those two. That's right now a mountain fold. Now we are going to get ourselves a valley fold. Meaning, here's the second trivial line segment this one right here. From this point onwards, we can actually leave this flap over, okay? We are going to keep this flap. That's going to be a triangle that we are going to preserve. That's a projection of this triangle right here, meaning it's going to lie right here exactly. And now we are going to connect ourselves. This corner right here and this point, okay? meaning we are going to get some kind of line segments which runs from right here to up there. Let us do this real quick. And after we are done with that, we actually divided our paper already in thirds because the point that we are going to get up here is actually one third of the paper. So it's now quite easy to fold it over. And in the next calculations, you can see how accurate this method is. You see, it's pretty accurate. So what have we gathered in this little folding clip? Okay, that's a little bit special. It's a little bit of a special math snack right here. So what we did, we had a square sheet of paper, okay? 
and what we did. We were folding this paper in half. That's a really easy fold. Everyone can do that. That's a characteristic line, I would say. So we are having this spot up here. Then we were doing another characteristic fold. We were folding it together and then we were connecting the corner and this new corner of the folded piece of paper. What we did after that was we were keeping this fold, meaning we were doing a projection of this right triangle on here. Okay, this has been our projection. After we did this projection, we were connecting the corner and this corner of the projection with a line. And what we had up here, th the point where this line intersects our edge of this line up here, actually was our third. Okay, so this is quite ingenious. I, I've never seen this method before using like a projection and it's pretty crazy. Like I said, I miscalculated at first, but after I did the, uh, did the calculations once again on another bus tour, it actually worked out. I, I didn't think it could work out any nice, but this is really a third. So, so what we want to do is we want to find out what this length up here is. We are going to call it C. Remember, it's a square sheet of paper, meaning this side length is, is A. This whole side length is also A. What we have up here is A over 2, so this side length right here. Now we are going to do some simple trigonometry and we are going to arrive at what we actually want to have. Okay, let's do some angle work right here. In a triangle, we always have pi radians. Okay, we are going to have pi right here. Also, we have this angle epsilon. This up here is pi over 2, that's a right angle, square sheet of paper by definition, that's a right um, angle. And we're going to call this thing delta, okay? This up here doesn't have too much of a point, this angle. I just want to make sure that you guys know that this right here is the projection of this triangle. Meaning, we were folding this over. This line is the same as this line. This has a side length of A. This angle is once again epsilon, this angle is delta, and this is actually a right triangle, a right angle, not a right triangle, just a right angle. Now, we can easily calculate other stuff, for example, this angle theta right here, because theta is with respect to epsilon, we can easily calculate this. Don't forget, this side length is A, this side length is A, this whole side length, meaning this triangle in itself isn't a right triangle, but it's an isosceles triangle and this helps a lot because we know you can just do some easy trigonometry and prove this. This angle right here is the same as this angle. We are going to call it gamma for example, Euler, Euler macaroni constant. <laughs> Meaning we can actually write our gamma with respect to our theta which you can write with respect to our epsilon. Okay, everything is going to be traced back to our original triangle that we had right here. This is why it works out so nicely. Now, all that's really left to do is to find out what this angle is because if we know what this angle is, we can actually just take the tangent because this line segment is A, this right here is C and we want to find out what C is. We're going to call this thing tau, this angle. And tau is with respect to gamma, which is with respect to theta, which is with respect to A, um, um, epsilon, not eta. Okay, as simple as that. Now let's just start writing out some systems of equations. What is epsilon? Well, if we take a look, tangent of epsilon, we have talked about this before in my most recent math snack, the, the one before this, take a look in the um, playlist. We know that the tangent of epsilon is nothing but opposite over adjacent, so a over two over a. a and a is going to cancel out to just one half. What does this mean especially? Well, on the interval from zero to pi over two, right here on a closed, um, interval, um, no open interval. Our tangent is actually bijective, meaning we can take the inverse tangent on both sides, okay? Meaning epsilon is nothing but the inverse tangent of one half, which is something irrational. It should be something irrational. It's not easy to deal with, but with the calculations we are going to do after another, we are going to arrive at something really nice, okay? Epsilon is nothing but this. Okay, coolio. Now, don't forget, each corner in the square is nothing but a right angle, meaning pi over two in this angle is, does consist of two epsilon plus 
like fader. This right here is a var fader, not this ugly looking fader everyone else uses. Okay, this, this right here is the fader for the smart people, for the cool boys. Andrew Dodson, please just use this fader right here because you're a smart people. Okay, now, like I said, faders with respect to epsilon. So why not solve for fader? Fader is nothing but pi over 2 minus 2 epsilon. Let us continue. In a triangle, like I said, we have inner angles which add up to pi. In this triangle, we have pi being equal to fader plus 2 times gamma. Okay, meaning if we solve for gamma, gamma will be nothing but, well, pi over 2 minus fader over 2. There's just one thing left to do, actually. Now, we once again have this right angle right here, main, meaning gamma plus tau is nothing but pi over 2. So gamma plus tau. We want to solve for tau, that's the most important part here. Meaning tau is actually nothing but pi over 2 minus gamma, but we know what gamma is. It's with respect to theta, which is with respect to epsilon. This is good, this is really, really good. Meaning if we subtract gamma from pi over 2, this and that is going to cancel out and we end up with, well, you guessed it, a positive angle, just theta over 2. But what is theta over 2? Well, it's nothing but this over 2, meaning this is nothing but pi over 4 minus epsilon. But what is epsilon? Epsilon, by our definition, is nothing but the inverse tension of 1 half. Okay? Doesn't look any good, right? Oh, okay, tau is just this thing right here, it's, it's nothing that looks too good at the moment. And actually epsilon is a solution to a really special right triangle, especially this thing right here, okay? Um, I made a video on the inverse tension of x plus the inverse tension of 1 over x is nothing but pi over 2. So meaning if you solve for delta, delta is going to be the inverse tension of 2, just as a matter of fact, you can go through the calculations too, so it's nothing but a over a over 2, it's nothing but 2, okay, up here if you go for delta. Never mind that, it's just something special I, I wanted to um, say to you guys. <laughs> a little something special from your daddy. Meaning, we want to find out what c is. Like I said, we are going to go for the tangent of tau. Tangent of tau is actually nothing but, okay, opposite over adjacent, so c over a. Meaning a is a positive line segment, strictly positive, it does exist in the Euclidean plane, meaning we can uh, multiply both sides by a. So c is nothing but a times the tangent of tau, but tau is nothing but this right here. Pi over 4 minus the inverse tangent of 1 half. <laughs> this looks even more ugly. And by what we have seen before in this little folding demonstration, this should actually be equal to one third. Doesn't look like it, right? It, it looks just really ugly. But this is why I made a video on this addition theorem. And, and in the bus I actually stopped here because I thought you couldn't simplify it any further and I was miscalculating once again. But, but I went through this addition theorem stuff, I um, derived it on the spot there and it's going to evaluate to um, one third. Otherwise I wouldn't make the video on folding a paper into thirds, okay? So this is nothing but a times. What do we have? So if this is a and b, I made a video on the addition theorem before, we are going to get that this is the tangent of pi over four minus, I, I have to have all this stuff in my hand, uh, in my head, I'm not going to work with any notes, tangent of um, inverse tangent of one half over then we are going to get this factor of 1 and then positive branch right here because we had a negative sign right here. So this is going to give us the tangent of pi over 4 times the tangent of the inverse tangent of 1 half. Doesn't look any good either, right? Because we have tension of some weird angle, whatever the fuck this is, and we have the tension of the inverse tension. Hey, this is actually good because if we have a function of the inverse function or the inverse function of the function, if stuff is bijective, it means we are going to end up with the argument in itself. So those expressions actually end up with just one half. This is good, but what the hell is tension of pi over four? I want you guys to consider the unit circle for this, okay? I made a video on the unit circle before, math snack, just before this one. 
We're going to construct ourselves lines once again on the unit circle. Don't forget this right here is our x coordinate, which is nothing but the cosine, and this right here is our y coordinate, which is nothing but the sine. Also, we have a radius of 1 right here. Length of this side is nothing but 1. How does this help? Okay, our angle is pi over 4. Don't forget, this is always going to tra uh, trace out the right triangle, meaning this is pi over 2. Pi over 2 plus pi over 4 is nothing but 3 pi over 4. Overall, our inner angles have to equal pi, meaning this angle up here is once again pi over 4. Okay, meaning two angles are the same right here, just like the scenario we had before, meaning this triangle is actually isosceles, meaning y is nothing but x and x is nothing but y because this thing right here is reflexive and transitive and symmetric. It's an equivalence relation. It's, it's pretty cool. It's an equal sign. <laughs> now, what is the tension exactly? Tangent is nothing but y over x, okay? Sine over cosine, meaning if y and x are the same, they are going to be y over y or x over x. It's nothing but one in this scenario. If you want to calculate what sine of pi over 4 actually is, and you can take a look at the phase space, for example, or just the sine wave. This right here is the sine wave, and this right here is nothing but the cosine wave. This right here is pi over 4. It's where those two lines intersect, those two graphs. What is the sine or cosine of pi over 4? Well, we also have Papa Pythagoras, meaning 1 is nothing but x squared plus y squared, but x is nothing but y, leaving us with 2x squared, for example, meaning in this quadrant, all the values of sine and cosine are strictly positive. We are going to take a look at the positive branch, meaning x is equal to y is nothing but, in this scenario, 1 over square root of 2. I hope this wasn't too fast. This is just some simple trigonometry. Point is, this thing right here is actually 1. Meaning, this is 1, and this thing right here is 1. I dropped my chart, I'm terribly sorry. What are we going to be left with? Well, nothing but 1 minus 1 half in this case, over 1 plus 1 half. This down here is 3 over 2, and this up here is 1 over 2, okay, 1 half. So 1 half over 3 over 2. 1 half and 1 half is actually going to cancel out. I forgot the A right here, this is important. 1 half and 1 half is going to cancel out. We are going to be left with a over 3. Isn't that cool? So it actually does also work out mathematically. It's quite hard constructing this right here because you can make many errors. The more folds you make, the more errors are bound to happen and the errors are getting bigger and bigger. So if you just fold this a little bit, to the right, then this line is not going to be exactly here, it's going to be here and the arrow is going to get really great overall. But never mind, if you do this projection correctly, you are going to end up with something really good here, namely one of the sides being folded in thirds. Now we are going to go for the second method and I want you guys to just take a look at the video. Now I'm going to erase this and I'm going to see you in a second. Now that we have covered the first method, let us continue. Once again, we would like to make a trivial twofold at first. Leaving us with this line segment yet again. And again, we have four choices, either doing this, 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 or this line segment. It really doesn't quite matter. We are going to go for the same one as before. Try to fold it as accurate as possible. And after doing that, we are left with this line segment right here, yet again. And now we are going to do one of the most trivial folds, the one connecting either of those corners. Really doesn't quite matter which one, but we want to let this line and this line meet. So you better fold this one right here. If you do this one, you are bound to actually do another fold like this. So we are going to connect those two. And the point we are going to get right here, where those intersect, is actually one third of our piece of paper. Meaning, if I turn this around and take a look at the intersection point, I can fold it over. And once again. And you are going to see how accurate this method is in a second. 
This time it's going to be way easier, just like you have seen. We can actually construct words just using two characteristic lines. What were those? Well, we basically made a center fold right here once again, folding this into two parts. Then we constructed this line right here and also this line. And this just consists of two easy lines to do. Okay, and this thing right here is actually going to mark the third on this line, but also quite magically, it's also the third of this line. So if you know this point right here, you actually can fold both sides into thirds. Okay, so this is quite magical and this thing right here is definitely more efficient, but not as cool to calculate as the one before. Okay, and well, we can simply calculate this using linear functions. Also, by the way, this method works for any arbitrary piece of paper, okay? It also works for just some regular rectangle piece of paper. Doesn't matter which size, which DIN norm, for example, the Deutsche Industrie norm Deutschland, okay? We are going to go for a square sheet of paper and after that for the generalization, you could say. So. For this, I would like to construct ourselves with a coordinate system. Let's say we are going to put a coordinate system into here. I want you guys to acknowledge the fact that this right here runs straight through our zero point, okay? Through the origin. Meaning, if we just put this coordinate system here once again, we have this line running up. And the cool thing is, this is just the identity line, meaning f of x is nothing but x. What else do we have? We had a very characteristic line. This line went from, okay, this up here is nothing but A. This is our side length A that we have up here. Um, and yeah, this is like up here, our A. Okay, I hope you can see this. And what we have right here, if this runs down, this actually goes through A over two. This is just how it works because this line right here actually divides it in the middle once again. This is A over two, this length. Meaning we have a few points once again to consider. If we want to construct ourselves G of X, it's going to be of the form AX plus B, where B is the shift on the Y axis. We can immediately see where this is. This is nothing but A. So B is nothing but um, A. Maybe using A right here wasn't too smart. Let's put M right here. I'm terribly sorry. So this thing right here is nothing but MX, MX plus A. And what is M? M is basically just our slope and it's really easy to calculate our slope. Either you see it or you don't. Let's calculate it. We have two points right here. On our X axis, we're going to have the point A over two comma zero. And here we are going to have zero comma A. Okay, those are our two points. Meaning M can be calculated as the difference in our Y values over the difference in the X values, just how the difference quotient works. This is nothing but, okay, let's say this is point number one. So we are going to have zero minus A over A over two minus zero, leaving us with just two in this case. Okay, I hope I'm not mistaken, negative two. It's negative two, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> Meaning, this is nothing but negative two times x plus a. And now, all that's really left to do is to find the point where this intersects, okay? Meaning, our linear functions actually intersect at probably one third of the line segment. Meaning, we are going to set f equal to g, that's equivalent to saying we have x being equal to negative two times x plus a. We want to solve for x, meaning we are going to put x here. That's equivalent to saying three x is nothing but a. Three, if you trust the piano axioms, is not equal to zero. X is nothing but a over three. Et voilà, Gucci as frick. This right here tells us that our x value is nothing but one third of the side length a. This works wonders, okay? Also, if you plug this into here, that's the identity function. It tells you that this is also one third of this side length. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? That's, that's so cool in my opinion. So this right here is the way easier method. And now we are going to go for some random arbitrary rectangle and then we are basically done with this math snake right here. And I hope you didn't show you what you have seen today. So what's the algorithm? We are going to divide this side up into two parts. This time we have A and B as our side lengths. Now 
We are also going to connect those two right here. So this is just some random function and we are going to connect this. And what we are going to get here is one third of this side and probably one third of this side. I'm not sure about that. We are going to see, we can just plug it in. Okay, this time I would like to place the coordinate system right here. So this is our orgo, our origin, meaning what is this? If we put this into a coordinate system, we are going to have this line. This time it's not the identity, it's some other line. Okay, down here it goes through 0, 0 and up here one of the points is nothing but B and A, right? Okay, so this thing is nothing but B and A. That's one of the points it actually goes through. What else do we have? We are going to have this line segment right here. It passes through somewhere actually, okay? Where does it pass through? It passes through, um, this down here is nothing but B and zero, right? This is B and zero. And up here, it also passes through the point. This is nothing but um, B over two and A. Okay, I have to think about everything I do here too. So we have some function F and we have some function G right here. Let us construct F at first. F is nothing but mx plus, okay, now I can choose b because we are using b in a different way, plus n. Okay, you see this thing isn't shifted up and down in this coordinate system, meaning n is nothing but zero, leaving us with mx. m we can calculate it once again as the difference of y values over the difference in x values, meaning this is actually nothing but a over b, okay? So we are going to get a over b right here a over b times x. It's just this point right here, it's as easy as it is. It's a, um, it's a vector starting from 0, 0. Now we are going to get g right here. g is actually shifted up and we can think about this a little bit differently. So this n right here, we don't need to calculate it. We can just um, find it out. So what do we have? Imagine we are going to take this piece of paper and plug it up here once again. Our line thus runs through, okay, if this is our y-axis, it runs through, well, 2a up here. Okay, I hope you can see where this comes from. Meaning we are going to get mx plus 2a. Or you can just simply calculate it. Find out your slope and then you can just calculate this um, absolute part right here, this, this y-axis um, cutter. <laughs> I don't know the English term right now, I'm terribly sorry. So what's our m once again? m can be calculated as follows. We are going to get 0 minus a over b minus b over 2. This is going to give us b over 2, meaning we are going to get negative 2a over b. This should do the trick, okay? Just simple arithmetic. I hope that's correct. Meaning we are going to get negative 2a over b times x plus 2a. Now, all that's really left to do is to set those two equal, just like we did before, and then we are done. Meaning, f being equal to g is going to result in, okay, we are going to have a over b times x being equal to negative 2a over b plus 2a. And don't forget your x right here. We can add this on both sides. x is a common factor. That's equivalent to saying we have x times a over b plus 2a over b, leaving us with 3a over b right here, being equal to 2 times a. We can actually cancel out the a's right here on both sides, it's not equal to 0. b is also not equal to 0, we can multiply by it, and 3 is not equal to 0, we can divide by it, meaning our x value is nothing but um, 2b over 3. Doesn't look like it's correct, right? But it is correct because this point right here, this x coordinate is actually nothing but two thirds of our line segment B, meaning this actually divides it into thirds, okay? This is a really nice generalization. And now what happens if we plug 2B over 3 into F, for example, we are going to get um, F of 2B over 3. It's going to give us, um, a over b times 2b over 3. This and that is going to cancel out. So 2a over 3. 
meaning this is two thirds of the way up of A. So meaning this method actually always divides our piece of paper into thirds from each side. And this is it. And <laughs> in my opinion, this was so much fun. Um, figuring this stuff out and just playing around with paper is so much fun. And maybe I'm going to make a video on dividing stuff into fifths. And like I said, prime number stuff is really hard to do. Prime numbers are the most ridiculous pieces of shits because they fuck up stuff so much. And constructing prime number stuff, they are the atoms of all the other composite numbers is really hard. So the dividing piece of paper into fifths and sevenths is really hard. It's just like a constructing irregular 17 gone, for example, is such a hard task. I don't even know if a 19 gone is actually possible to construct. Never mind that. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and dab the channel if you like, if you want to support channel, if you want to support channel with mobile desk teachers I created or support channel on Patreon. Up until the next video, have a constructive day. Hello, Africa, I appreciate you. Ciao.